and let me introduce our next speaker. Dr. Lindsay Brooks is co-author of Think and Live, Challenging Believers to Think and Thinkers to Believe. It's an introduction to apologetics. He's also been the longtime host of the Apologetics.com radio show and pioneered uh, that political theology show. Uh, Dr. Lindsay is currently developing a web-based apologetics and public theology vlog called The Philadelphians. The Philadelphians.com is where it will be located in cooperation with apologetics.com. And he is co-authoring a forthcoming book on Christianity and the problem of race entitled Critical Grace Theory, co-authoring with his wife, Dr. Jamila Brooks, who lives in Philadelphia uh, with their uh, two, uh, youngest two of four children. Dr. Brooks' presentation today is the objective beauty of the doctrine of eternal punishment and its gospel value. So, I'm very interested in this presentation for a couple of reasons. I grew up third generation Southern Baptist pastor. Uh, ECT, eternal conscious torment, was all that I'd ever been taught. Uh, it is uh, the majority view of people in our church. I have come to the position of conditional immortality uh, over time. Uh, but uh, I am looking forward to a presentation on the beauty of eternal conscious torment from an apologist. Uh, and frankly, uh, this is an interesting topic. But second, I'm glad that Dr. Brooks is here because he was taught by Dr. John Stamm, the former missionary pastor from our church. And uh, I know You've got some stories on Dr. Stan. So let's give a good, warm welcome to our next plenary speaker. Come on up, Dr. Stan. <laughs> My dearly beloved in Christ. Uh, can I pray for just a moment? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for our health today. Thank you for eager minds today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I humbly thank God for the opportunity to think with you through the intersection of two quite challenging subjects, eternal punishment, theological aesthetics, big words, big words. <laughs> um, I, I will try not to use too much jargon, uh, but some of these ideas are actually really, really intuitive for us once we start connecting some of these dots. So I want to thank Chris Date and all the Rethinking Hell folks for inviting me a second time. I spoke in 2015 uh, on how we're reading the Bible differently. That great word hermeneutics, you've heard that several times today, simply just means how we're reading stuff. And so we, we talked about that back in 2015. Um, I also want to thank, uh, you know, Pastor Wade uh, and all of you here at Emmanuel Enid, your hospitality is sterling. I have been completely blessed by you, and I really appreciate you. Uh, a word of shameless self-promotion. Uh, my newest partnership with apologetics.com is a vlog. If you know what that is, you guys ever watch YouTube and stuff, a vlog? It's a, it's a video uh, blog, and a blog is just a place where you go write stuff on the internet and stick it up, right? It's sort of 
publishing. But in this case, it's a video format, and just lets me sort of talk about public theology. And public theology is just the theology of how we live together in public. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, my previous project was called That Political Theology Show, all the stuff you're not supposed to talk, to, uh, talk about at uh, Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, so check that out at thephiladelphians.com, and we've imported some of the stuff from That Political Theology Show over there, so you can, you can actually watch some content right away. Um, we'll have an official launch probably in a month. So I hope that you find the things that I'm about to say compelling, and I'm aware that the title of this is a little provocative, but I hope that you find that I'm being sensitive. Uh, most of all, that I am contending earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. I know that some of you are very much concerned for loved ones who do not believe in Jesus. And that you can't imagine enjoying a heaven in which the smoke of their torment rises from ages unto ages. And it would seem to be a cost too high for the salvation of some that others, even babies not a cubit long, would populate the place of God's eternal disfavor. But I want you to take out of your imaginations those Hieronymus Bosch paintings that you saw in high school art class with demons like pulling out the entrails of people uh, and tormenting people in hell. And I would like for you to expunge from your thoughts just for a little while uh, Dante's Inferno, which, you know, is quite an incredible work of art, um, but it has informed the way that we view what it is that we're even talking about. So I'm going to ask you to just come with a blank slate this morning, if you can. I know that it's hard. But sweep this, the plate clean on what we think we might mean when we say the H word. So let's get to the indictment of the doctrine. Like, why am I here talking to you about why the doctrine is beautiful? Well, here we have David Bentley Hart, who is an Eastern Orthodox Christian, and he is a, a philosopher, and I've learned a lot from him with regard to philosophy of mind, and, and he's a theologian, and um, Dr. Jones, he's, a, he's one of these guys who actually likes origin. <laughs> so, you know. He says, the God in whom the majority of Christians throughout history have professed to believe often seems to be evil, at least judging by the dreadful things that we habitually say about him. Within a certain traditional understanding of grace and predestination, Calvinism. <laughs> The choice to worship God rather than the devil is at most a matter of prudence. It is not the logic of the claims that bothers me. It is their moral hideousness. Moral hideousness. So he's trying to give us some categories here by his way of talking about what is hideous, what is not beautiful, what is uh, uh, is not comely, uh, and associating that with something that is immoral. There's something about that that we can use this language of beautiful, morally beautiful, or morally hideous. And, and David Bentley Hart here talking about moral hideousness. He's a universalist, by the way. Uh, he uh, very much follows one of the other early church fathers, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, one of the Cappadocians. That's another great word um, in that. Now, uh, here's John Stott. And I'm only quoting him partially. 
Uh, to his credit, John Stott immediately says after this that notwithstanding this strong rebuke, his emotions don't determine the matter, but rather Scripture. But before he says that, he says this. Emotionally, I find the concept intolerable. I do not understand how people can live with it without either cauterizing their feelings or cracking under the strain. So you can see, my friends, that, that now the well is poisoned. No matter what he says after this, well, this, even if, I guess if the scriptures teach it, then I'll have to crack under the strain. I suppose if the, the scriptures teach it, then I'll have to cauterize my feelings. And this is why I have to talk with you today. So while I think it's important to engage with my hosts, uh, and, and indeed, everybody who's spoken so far and my long friendship with Chris Date, uh, it tempts me sorely to not just interact with what everybody has already said to you today. Uh, but I need to address this. We need to come to some kind of understanding regarding whether or not the doctrine of hell is reflective of the goodness of God and is therefore beautiful. So let's state the doctrine. Now I'm going to use the Westminster Confession of Faith here to state the doctrine. The Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, you know, dates are really terrible to give, but you know, uh, let's say 400 years ago or so. It's been a while. It's old. It's, it's you know, hallowed by usage, as they say. It's, it's the, the confession of my own denomination. And the London Baptist Confession of Faith agrees idea for idea with this section. It says, the, uh, the bodies of men after death return to dust and see corruption, but their souls, which neither die nor sleep, having an immortal subsistence, immediately return to God who gave them. The souls of the righteous being made perfect in holiness are received to the highest heavens where they behold the face of God in light and glory, waiting for the full redemption of their bodies and, their soul, and the souls of the wicked are cast into hell where they remain in torments and utter darkness reserved to the judgment of the great day. The bodies of the unjust shall, by the power of Christ, be raised to, to dishonor. The bodies of the just, by his spirit, unto honor, and be made conformable to his own glorious body. Now, this is regarding the intermediate state, so let's get that vocabulary out of the way. The intermediate state is the state after you die, but before the judgment day. I have very simple eschatology, right? <laughs> There's going to be a day when Jesus comes and judges everybody. That's enough for us to know. But until that time, we're still dying. We call the, the intermediate state the point after we die, but before that resurrection and judgment. And this is what this is about. So I want you to notice some terms here. Immortal subsistence. Now I'm going to attend to this in some detail later. But in my denomination, in my ordination, I have to accept this doctrine to be ordained. And Reformed Baptists do too. Southern Baptist Convention is a little more welcoming of uh, some nuance, but here it's pretty clear. Um, the second thing I want you to notice is the term glorious. Glorious. We're starting to hint here at this language of beauty. In Greek, Doxa. I know, we're throwing vocabulary in different languages and dates at you all in one talk. Doxa, it just means glory. 
Now, our conception of beauty usually means pretty. We think about beauty and prettiness. But that's not quite enough, right? We see a cute figurine uh, at a store and we go, oh, and, and, and that's beautiful to us. But we could also say, see a thunderstorm and it's frightening and it's powerful. And it's not pretty per se, it's more than pretty, it's beyond pretty, there's something terrible and wonderful about it. But do you see how I'm using this language, terrible and wonderful together? Let's start thinking in those terms. Glory, doxa, that's the Greek uh, kavod if you are into Hebrew. Everybody say kavod. 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 Glory, heaviness, weight. These are the terms that we're starting to deal with here. This is the final judgment part. This is the after the intermediate state part of my confession. It says, God has appointed a day wherein he will judge the world in righteousness by Jesus Christ, to whom all power and judgment is given of the Father, in which day not only the apostate angels shall be judged, But likewise, all persons that have lived upon the earth shall appear before the tribunal of Christ and give an account for their thoughts, words, and deeds to be received according to, and to receive according to what they have done in the body, whether good or evil. The end of God's appointing this day is for the manifestation of what? Glory the glory of his mercy, and in the eternal salvation of the elect, and of his justice, in the damnation of the reprobate, who are wicked and disobedient. For then shall the righteous go into everlasting life and receive that fullness of joy and refreshing which comes from the presence of the Lord. That's going to come back to us. But the wicked, who know not God, And obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ shall be cast into eternal torments and punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Wow. If you'd never seen it before, you would think that the Westminster divines who wrote this thought the doctrine was beautiful. All this talk of glory from God. Well, Elder Brooks, that's not the Bible. Do you see, did I leave in here all the little footnote letters? Every single one of those footnote letters leads to biblical proof text in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Okay, there's the definition. There's your footnotes. And it's all Bible. So these things are what the Westminster divines really thought the Bible taught about this doctrine of eternal punishment. So what am I trying to give you today? I wish to bring about two ways of understanding the beauty of this doctrine. First, that the doctrine itself is beautiful. And then second, that the doctrine is about the beauty of God. The doctrine itself, meaning its structure, its And we'll go into what I mean by beautiful a little bit more, but its structure, its proportionality, uh, its symmetry are all going to be things that evidence to us that the doctrine itself is beautiful, even if we recoil. But then the doctrine is about beauty. It is about the beauty of God. 
And in order to understand what we mean by hell and the beauty of God and how that all fits together, we actually have to do a little thought about what we think beauty is and does. As a doctrine, it's to be evaluated within the whole of the faith that it's situated in. Not merely taken out of context and judged apart from the whole of the story of creation and fall and redemption and eschatological consummation that gives it its meaning. The creation happens with the end in mind. And all the intervening events are the means that God has ordained from the foundation of the world. God chose freely not to jump to the end, obviating all those individual lives in this fallen world. Do you get that? God created this world with the end in mind, but didn't skip all those steps in between. He didn't skip all the abuse and all the divorce and all the cancer. He didn't skip Hitler. But he created this world with the end in mind. As theology, it is God's beauty that gives meaning to what it is to be cast out from him. The nature of beauty is that it is compelling. Our response to beauty is not mostly pleasure, at least not in the most profound beauty. It can be fear. It can be tears, heartbreak, Longing. These are typological of either the fulfillment of Christ for all those longings and fears and tears, or they can be a taste of the suffering that is to come. Don't rush past that. Beauty, even the kind made by humans, wounds us. It is more fitting for an event of profound beauty to bring us tears rather than smiles. We would do well to consider that in this age of grace, the church age, such beauty-induced suffering can be cathartic. It can be healing. And point beyond it to a hoped-for fulfillment The Roman Catholic poet, St. John of the Cross, who wrote in his spiritual canticle this, he says, oh, I didn't make a slide of this, so just listen, I'm sorry, I know it's hard to listen to a reading, a quote. Where have you hidden yourself and abandoned me in my groaning, my beloved? You have fled like the heart, having wounded me, I ran after you crying and you were gone. O shepherds who go through the sheep gate upon the hill, if you shall see him who I love the most, tell me where he has gone. He's seeking after a beloved beauty that has wounded his soul. Beauty wounds us. The central aesthetic truth in all the universe is that God is beautiful. I do not use the term as a predicate, but as identity. Now somebody said, are you going to be talking about what the meaning of the word is, is, because... You know, on that level, I don't know if I can follow you. Yes, that's exactly what I'm doing. If, if I, here's a test for you, right? If I say, God is beauty, 
and you can flip it over and say beauty is God, then you are using the is of identity. Okay? You follow? If I say God is beauty and I flip it over and I can't say beauty is God, then I'm using the is of predication. I'm saying that, that, that God uh, has the quality of beauty. You see what I'm saying there? But I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying God is beauty as the is of identity. You with me? God is the very reality we call beauty. We affirm also what the Bible says about God, that he is good. That is, God is the very reality called good because God is simple, meaning he is not made up of parts, right? I, I, you don't have the pretty part of God and the angry part of God. You see what I'm saying? There, God is simple. He's not made up of parts. Because if he was made up of parts, then there would have to be something prior to God that assembled the parts. You see what I'm saying? As the first principle of all the things that exist, God is simple. And this is taught in the Bible when it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. So God is simple. So when we say God is good, we mean all of God is good and anything called good has to be participating in God's goodness in some sense. But there's a corollary here. If God is good and God is beautiful, then the good and the beautiful are coextensive. They are convertible terms. Do you follow that? They mean the same thing. So how are we using the term? I'm giving you some philosophical stuff because the theological language would take me too long to unpack, and this is just a shortcut. So um, if you want to talk to me later when we have more time over coffee... I would gladly sit with you and we can go through the, the, the biblical theological aesthetics, but I'm using philosophy as a shortcut here. So we have uh, Thomas Aquinas, Summa Theologica. He's a theologian. He, uh, he says that beauty includes um, integritas, consonantia, and claritas. Okay. Wholeness. Integrity. Consonants. An agreement of its parts, if it has parts. The doctrine has parts, God does not. But we can, we can talk about, if it does have parts, that those parts are in agreement with one another. And lastly, clarity. Um, he's talking about visual beauty, and so he's talking about brightness, luminosity, uh, but we can use it conceptually, right? The, the brightness and clarity of the thought. Aristotle in the metaphysics says, the chief forms of beauty are order, symmetry, definiteness. Now, definiteness is hard to define, but order and symmetry are pretty clear, and those are going to be a big part of what we talk about today. Here are some helps from theology and philosophy to poke around this idea of beauty. Remember that I said beauty compels. One 20th century theologian said that goodness without beauty loses its attractiveness, the self-evidence for why it must be carried out. Think about that. We have what we call the transcendentals, the good, the true, and the beautiful. And, and and they are hard to separate from one another. In fact, I just told you that the good and, and the beautiful are, are essentially the same terms. If we sell beauty down the river and take it out of our theological consideration, the good loses the reason why we should do it. It doesn't compel us to do anymore. 
truth begins to look like a computer spewing out numbers of data that all agree and all are correct, but compels no one. So wholeness, consonance, luminosity, um, order, symmetry, all of these things go together with true and good. True. Uh, we're really good at that in the church. We can tell you what the truth is. Good, we're awesome at that in the church. We're really good at, at telling people what the moral thing is. But sometimes it feels like we've sold beauty down the river to the culture. Can we take it back? Can we take it back even with this doctrine? One other aspect of beauty I want to get to. Um, here's uh, Socrates and Xenophon. Socrates didn't write a word. <laughs> so we know about him from Plato, and we know about him from Xenophon. So here's uh, Xenophon. He says, uh, Socrates says, in short, everything in w uh, which we use is considered both good and beautiful from the same point of view, namely its use. Aristippus answers and says, why then is a dung basket a beautiful thing? Socrates says, of course it is. And a golden shield is ugly if the one be beautifully fitted to its purpose and the other ill. So mull that over, stick that in the back of your head and say, what is the doctrine of eternal punishment for? I can never tell. We printed these out, and I can't tell which, where I'm at. Okay. Uh, this is simply another way to state that exact same thing from a biblical perspective. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news. This is Isaiah. Isaiah will keep coming back to us, my friends. Uh, why are feet beautiful? Right? There is a purpose. There's a transfer of the purpose to the object. The good news delivered by those feet makes those feet beautiful in the coming. This is a restatement of what I've now said a couple of times. Beauty and goodness in a thing are identical fundamentally. So let's dwell on this for a moment. Let's dwell on the goodness of God. What we mean is that Good means God, and we're not, uh, we're, it's not that we're perceiving uh, some kind of goodness in God's nature. We're saying that God's nature is identical with the good. And that goodness is relational, because God is relational. God is Trinity. So in his very being, that fellowship that relationality, that's good. And if goodness and beauty are convertible terms, it's also beautiful. It also gives pleasure. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. This is... a. Uh, Speaking to the relationship between the good and anything else. What partnership has right, righteousness with lawlessness? None. There's no fellowship at all between God and evil. This is a crucial, this is a crucial idea because by necessity... It excludes privation, admixture, evil. Evil is excluded, my friends. It is good that God has no fellowship with evil. completely contrary to evil 
to be good. Therefore, it is completely contrary to evil to be beautiful. Do you see the relationship? Now, I should take a moment here to differentiate between taste as an expression of our personal preference and objective aesthetic valuation. So there's objective beauty. And we've given some criteria by which we're measuring that, symmetry and order and all of these things. If I say I like something, that's a statement about me. I like French fries. French fries are objectively bad food. <laughs> Every measure that we have for what food is and what it's supposed to do is subverted by French fries. Too much salt, too much fat, tons of starch. No, there's, there's no uh, vitamins in French fries. <laughs> but okra. I do not like okra, but I can tell you, and I've, I, okay, I know, I know. I know where I am. <laughs> Oklahoma. You're welcome. You're welcome. I promised I would bring the dad jokes today. That was a God thing. Um, but, but it's objectively good food. It does everything food is supposed to do. My personal feelings about it have absolutely nothing to do about with which is actually good food. But my preference matters a lot to me. So in light of that, it is possible to have an aversion to the doctrine of eternal punishment and yet recognize its perfections on objective grounds. We may even grow in our emotional harmony with that through sanctification. Uh, that's happened to me on many things. Something in the Bible strikes me as weird and I don't like it. 10 years later, that's exactly what I believe. Okay. Now we get into the nature of hell. Hell is by its very nature dissonance with God. Consonance, dissonance. Consonance, harmony. Dissonance, not harmony. <laughs> Conflict. Antipathy. Now, um, It is possible for a person who is not in harmony with God to be very nice. And in fact, we may like them very much. We may love them. In fact, we're commanded to love them. Um, but Augustine talks about two cities, right? The city of God and the city of man. And, and here's the secret. They're the same city, just from two different perspectives. So the city of God, um, it, it is the city where those citizens are trying their very best to live what God has for us, to be in consonance with God. The city of man can mimic some of those things, right? We're supposed to be civil even in the city of man, for example. It seems to be, there's almost no sin as bad as being uncivil in the city of man. But there's a tremendous difference between the two. And to use an artistic example of what this might be, it's the difference between earnest, godly, devotional art and kitsch. 
So uh, Roger Scruton, um, who is a philosopher, he says, uh, simply put, uh, kitsch is not, in the first instance, an artistic phenomenon, but a disease of faith. Kitsch begins in doctrine, ideology, and spreads from there to the entire world of culture. So, you know, what, what is this, Kitsch? Uh, there was a, a, a movie where George Carlin was in it, and he played a minister, and uh, he, he just wanted to make Jesus more friendly. So he stuck a statue on the front with Jesus with a big smile and a thumbs up. It's Kitsch. Now, it's used in that case for satire, but, but sometimes Kitsch is unintentional, right? It's just bad art. Differentiating any dissonance with God is not going to necessarily, of course, you're going to have terrible, terrible evil men who do terrible, terrible evil things. But sometimes it's just a little twist, just a little kitsch in our humanity. The true humanity is with, comes from within the city of God. Christ is the true humanity, and as we pursue Christ, we become more and more the new human. The old man, Adam, falls away, but in Adam all die. Here are the symptoms. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having appearance of godliness but denying its power. So you know that it is possible to have the appearance of godliness. And yet... It's kitsch. It's not the genuine devotional love. These are the presenting systems. The disease itself is the hatred of God. You see, I don't come into your house with a sharpie and draw mustaches on the images of you and your family because I hate photo paper. What do I hate when that is being done? You! The image on the paper is a proxy for you. So when I... When someone murders you, Do they just hate you? Or do they hate the one whose image you are? And every single instance of what it could possibly mean to hate you is hatred for the one who made you in his image. If I am rude to you, impatient with you. These are not mere peccadillos. These are not little things, my friends. Jesus said, if you hate your neighbor in your heart, you've already murdered them. If you fail in one point of the law, how much of the law have you broken? All of the law. Because disobedience in one place is hatred of God. I need to convince you of this. This is what the Bible teaches. If what I'm saying to you is true, you could know people who are lovely. They're almost godly. You can be a person. I can be a person who is almost godly. 
but it's the almost that betrays what the thing truly is. There is then not one of us in this room who have not sinned against the holy God and are fully deserving of wrath. Hopefully on all this, everybody agrees. Hopefully I've said nothing so far that goes, meh, maybe not. If, if you're a Christian and you read the Bible, I think this much is clear, and I know that my brother said you shouldn't be saying the Bible is super clear, but I think on this, it seems super clear. The cross, my friends, is where we're going to learn about hell. I know, that seems counterintuitive. But what did Jesus cry out? What is the cry of dereliction? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Who is he addressing? My God. But wait a minute. When he breathes out his last... Who is he addressing there? Into my hands I commend my, my into your hands I commend my spirit. Who? Father. Into your hands I commend my spirit. But here, it's God. Judgment has been given for sin, and he has taken it upon himself. Yes, I know that he's referring to Psalm 22. And he wants you to look there at the suffering that the psalmist writes out for us. Yes, it's theological. Yes, he's giving us theology. But this is part of the beauty of Scripture. He's also really crying out. After the darkness at midday, You see, the whole of the setting is aesthetically pointing us to darkness and abandonment. These are terms for hell. These are not incidental. The nature of humanity is that we are lovers of self and haters of God. And we have wronged the one who is beautiful and most worthy. We have crucified the Lord of glory. So our figurative language for hell, fire and brimstone, smoke and torment, outer darkness, the cup of his anger, the wine of the wrath of God. Greg Beale notes that the the torment is primarily spiritual and psychological suffering. So these things, these are metaphors. Every metaphor, every analogy has things that say yes and things that say no, right? Things that say no would be things that we would call uh, equivocal. Things that say yes are things that we would call univocal. All right. In other words, um, if you've never seen the screw propeller on a ship before, and I'm trying to describe it to you, and I say, well, it's kind of like a canoe paddle. I don't mean that it's made of wood, because it's not. And I don't mean that it's small and handheld, because it's not. And I don't mean that it's the same shape or the same size, none of that. I mean that it's used to push water while you're in a vessel. 
That's the univocal point of contact. Everything else is equivocation, but they are analogous. Do you see what I'm saying here? So when we look at these terms, we should understand them as analogy for torments that are psychological and spiritual in nature. While in this life, the aesthetic tends to wound cathartically, in final judgment, God, who has removed his beneficent mitigation, sorry, I love words, God has removed the way that he softens our evil. Uh, so we're free at the end of days to hate God with all our might. I'm sorely tempted here to just play some beautiful music for you and let you contemplate it in the silence of the aftermath of that beauty for the remainder of our time. Because I think you will find yourself wounded. Why should beauty hurt us? Should be the question foremost in your mind. Part of the disagreement between my conditionalist friends and I is in the idea that the state of affairs is permanent for human beings after death and after judgment. So unfortunately, I have a little more work to do. We have to talk for a moment about the this idea of the symmetry of this doctrine that rests upon the idea that we have immortal subsistence. So earlier I quoted the Westminster Confession and I read it to you and you heard this at that time, but I'm going to say this part again. Their souls which neither die nor sleep having an immortal subsistence immediately returned to God and gave them. And here's some scripture that points us in that direction. The dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. And it is appointed for man once to die. And then the judgment. Physical death is here referred to. If you have one physical death in this respect. The symmetry of the doctrine is built on the understanding of Scripture that human beings were endowed with an immortal subsistence as the image of God, the imago Dei. It's always better when I say it in Latin. Here we begin to tread on ground of theology that appears as, say, the air that we're breathing or the ocean that other doctrines might swim in. The proofs are subtle, and sometimes we even take them for granted. And I think even the language of the confession here takes it for granted. Edward D. Morris says the doctrine is a doctrine of immortality as an original endowment of the soul is indeed one of the fundamental elements of Christianity. It is based immediately on scripture and especially on the New Testament. On these biblical grounds, the doctrine was incorporated in the first of the Christian creeds in the concluding words, the life everlasting. The life everlasting. Immortal subsistence was believed by the earliest Christians. And this is evidence of that. Here's some more Bible for you. You see... We've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. But notice, and to the spirits of righteous made perfect. And this is speaking of the, this intermediate state. We're joined in communion with the spirits of the living, not of the dead. Calvin says, the spirits of just men, etc. He adds this to intimate that we are joined to holy souls, which have 
put off their bodies and left behind them all the filth of this world. And hence he says that they are consecrated or made perfect for they are no more subject to the infirmities of the flesh having laid aside the flesh itself. And hence we may with certainty conclude that pious souls separated from the body still live with God and we could not possibly be otherwise joined to them as companions. This is a little trickier theology. He has put eternity into the heart of man. While the interpretation of this passage is fraught, and it is, uh, interpreting the Hebrew on this is heavy. If our translators are in the ballpark with translating olam as eternity, in the very center of what it means to be human, the heart, it is conceivable that the passage is teaching endlessness of days, not just in our awareness, but in our existence. Think about the heart. When God takes out a heart of stone and puts in a heart of flesh, it's not just a mental thing. It's something subsisting in your soul. So here he's put eternity into the heart of man. And this gives us a beautiful symmetry with regard to human relationships with God in both Christ and naturally. In Christ, the fitting expression of our harmony with God is its unfolding in an unending succession of ages of ages. And in the natural condition of man setting himself in opposition to God, that relationship is also to the unfolding of ages of ages. Eternity, as a subsisting condition of the Imago Dei, no less than knowledge or moral action. Stop there, because I can, I can feel the glaze over happening. Do you have knowledge? One of the things about being the image of God is that you have knowledge. Do you know right and wrong, good and evil? Moral knowledge and moral action are part of what it means to be the image of God. When a lion kills a zebra, no one says, what an immoral beast. Because we don't predicate of animals' moral action. When a dog has no idea what you're talking about, we don't think... We don't even expect them to be human, you see? <laughs> okay, some of you do. I see you with your dogs. No, no, no. This is part of what it means to be the image of God. Knowledge and original righteousness subsist, and they persist beyond the fall. I suggest to you that eternity of days, the immortality that's written onto your heart stays beyond the fall. This creates the symmetry. So here in Luke, we're talking about Lazarus and the rich man. Abraham speaks down to Lazarus, who is uncomfortable. There's no air conditioning in his house. Uh, Abraham says, child, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, received bad things. Now he is comforted, and you are in anguish. Is it a parable? Is it an analogy? Maybe. Even probably. But let's say that it is. What is the univocal point of contact in this analogy? Remember we said analogies say yes and no. Well, what is, what is this place and this chasm between paradise and and Damnation, what, what is it pointing to beyond itself? 
That's one of the ways that we have to read these texts. We have to understand what its purpose is. Why is it even here? Matthew 25, 46, here's that symmetry again. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Uh, Four years ago, we had an extensive discussion about this symmetry. Eternal life and eternal punishment or eternal life and the eternal abiding effects of a destruction. Where does symmetry lie? Now, this may not, that may not 100% sway you, but it's heavy, and I think you should wrestle with it. Because this looks like a parallel construction. This looks like it ought to be symmetrical. And if it is not, and I know Chris thinks that it is symmetrical in his reading, But I think I can demonstrate that eternal life does not refer to an event and then its abiding effects. It refers to life and life and life and life. Unto an eternity of days, unto ages of ages. But if on... Chris is reading and Fudge is reading and it, it refers to an event and then the abiding effects of that event. I, I, I don't think you've preserved the beauty, the symmetry of the text. All right. Um, We're at the stakes for the gospel because that's what this is about. And I know that I'm running long. I think I had to run long. But what are the stakes? Why does it matter that this is beautiful? Well, what if you're persuading a soul who's sensitive to beauty and is afflicted by the horrors of the world? What if... What if you're dealing with a young person? They all have the souls of poets. Their hearts break over everything. Can you point them to a fulfillment of all their restlessness in God, just as Augustine in Confessions did? And can you point them to that same beauty and that same goodness that wounds as in Isaiah 6. What does Isaiah say? Woe is me for I am undone. I love the way that the King James reads on that. Woe is me for I am lost. Why is he lost? Because he's seen the Lord. He sees himself for who he truly is and he sees the beauty of the Lord and he's wounded. When Jesus was suffering and, did, and cried out in dereliction on the cross, is that what killed his body? Or was it something else? Was it the abuse and the crucifixion and the spear in the side? No, his body wasn't killed by enduring what hell is for us, for our sake. Not in the sense that we're talking about. The death that we die now is analogous of the second death. There's something in it that says yes and something is it in it that says no. So I'm going to challenge you here. Think about what death is. Consider your death. 
Consider Adam and Eve. On the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. What happened? You shall surely die in 900 years? Or is that death that happened 900 years later an effect of the death that happened on the day they ate of it? Now, I, I have more stakes for the gospel and I have 21 theses for you and I cannot go through them all. I, want, I, I don't even know what time it is. I'm terrible at this. <laughs> but I want you to think about the beauty of God. Take a walk in the beautiful cool of the morning tomorrow before you come to church. And listen to the birds singing. Let it refresh your soul. And then think about how remote you feel from it. Think about how angry you get trying to get the kids out the door to church. Think about how dissonant our lives are with God. And that that dissonance is because we behold God's beauty and despise it. And then think about the cross. Turn around. Repent. Turn away from your anger toward your children and your wives and the imperfection that you feel when you look at the perfections of nature. And believe the gospel. You see, a thing's beauty is also measured in what it does. Do you remember that from earlier? What this should be doing to us is turning us to the cross of Christ, to the gospel of Jesus Christ, who suffered, died, was buried, but on the third day, he got up. My dearly beloved in Christ, can we pray? Thank you humbly, Lord, for this time. Thank you again for these lovely people who have come on a Saturday to listen to difficult theology, but who came with a worshipful heart and a worshipful spirit Let us look upon one another and see your image and love each other. For how can we love the God who we can't see if we cannot love the brother in front of us who we can see? Help us to repent from our evil and return to you in Christ. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give Dr. Brooks a hand. Great job. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take about 15 minutes for a Q&A, and we're going to move it down here. The sound guys ask if we could ask the questions from here. And so Michael's going to help us out. We'll get lined up. And Dr. Brooks, i tell you what I have to say. It was amazing. Uh, really enjoyed it. We've got a big staff here, and some of our pastors are dispensationalists. And, and one, I'm not, but one who is, has his THD from Dallas, and sometimes he'll speak. And when he gets done, I say, thou almost persuadest me to be a dispensationalist. <laughs> thou almost persuadest me to be a believer in eternal conscious torment. You did an amazing job showing the objective beauty of your position. Uh, Here is um, my question. Um, In listening to you, I know you're not a Spurgeon fan. I happen to be. In fact, (laughs) I want to take you to my office, and I've got several things from Spurgeon that are uh, original from his own hand. Uh, But I disagree with him on the subject of hell. Hmm. And it's fascinating tying what you said today with what Dr. Pritchett said last night. So do you. Because he mentioned, Spurgeon mentioned, that any hell that is metaphorical is not real. 
It'd be like me saying, someone boxed me metaphorically. It doesn't hurt. The hell I heard you just describe is metaphorical. The absence of the objective beauty of God and the withdrawal of his mitigating benefits, meaning you now are free to hate God with your whole heart. Mm. To be candid with you, I mean, I see that. I mm. think that's how people are living. I say to people all the time, there's two hells, the one you're in now and the one to come. Mm. And the hell you're in now, you don't see the objective beauty of God. So, well done. But my question is this. Do you not see how from an eternal conscious torment perspective, you're not a believer in eternal conscious torment because the torment is not coming from a judicious God. The torment is coming from within the human being. Well, I mean, I think you've answered the question in the question graciously, I think maybe. You're very kind to me. Um, if the torment comes within you, is it torment? It's still torment. I think Isaiah was tormented. Um, God being opposed to evil is an eternal state of God. There's never a time that he's not. Uh, that he's gracious with us through his creation is an amazing mystery. Um, but even the torments that we experience here right. are the result of sin. So some of those torments come from within. Look at, you know, how many times can I tell you that you know, I should have just listened to my mother and I didn't listen to my mother and it caused me tremendous torment. Did it cause me sort of physical torment? Did my mother's words of advice, did they, did my mother have to come and torment? Well, okay, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes she did. But did she have to? When I objectified someone, treated them poorly, treated them as less than human, and then saw the horror of my works, mm. saw the ways that I contribute to the human condition of suffering. Mm. Um, no, the nature of the thing tormented me and my nature in the face of it. Very good. Questions? Here we go. Sorry to have to make you come all the way down to the front. And we've got about 10 minutes and speakers for the breakouts. Be ready to come give a quick presentation on what you'll be talking about. Yes, sir. Thank you, Lindy. I really appreciated your uh, pastoral and your uh, uh, gracious tone. Mm -hmm. I really appreciated that. Um, the one thing that I was thinking about is the problem of evil and suffering and the solution to that. I tend to think of, and I'm a conditionalist, so I tend to think of, you know, you have creation, you know, the creation of the, the earth and the heaven, and you have the new creation. And see, God created this world, and in comes evil and suffering. And I see the end as the solution of this problem of evil and suffering. And I want, I want to make sure I understand you correctly, but it seems like in your symmetry, evil is immortalized. Mm -hmm. Evil exists forever. And so I'm wondering, how do you answer that question? How is that a solution to the problem of evil and suffering? Yeah, um, I admit that this is a hard one. Um, and I admit that this is part of why Gregory of Nyssa and his intuitions about universalism such that even... The devil, even Satan, is redeemed in the end. Uh, has um, a, a tremendous sort of uh, preferential purchase on the soul. You can feel 
that if God is going to be all in all, that, oh, it just, it, it, it makes such sense. But very few of us actually believe that the Bible teaches that the devil, the serpent of old, the dragon, is going to um, turn, realize by the woundings of the beauty of God that, that he needs to be in love with God instead of hate him. So if it's possible there, then it's possible for us if we are immortal. Another question, though, that's related to this also, and it's a difficulty for my position, I admit, uh, is that I said beauty compels. Mm. And there's a sense that beauty, um, when you really see it, you really love it, even though it hurts you. And, and, and I understand that, that, that maybe kind of I have some work to do with regard to how I understand the nature of beauty and, and its uh, compulsion of the human soul. Um, you know, uh, it has been said that if, you know, if you see the good and you reject it, then you didn't really see the good. Well, that's hard for me, understanding the mystery of the fall. The fall is a mystery, isn't it? You have Adam and Eve, and they walked with God in the cool of the evening, and they had fellowship. Uh, certainly Adam had fellowship unbroken, and Adam heard from the very mouth of God the exact law. So it's kind of no excuse, right? He truly saw God, and he was truly there, and yet fell, and that's a tremendous difficulty. And, 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 and so I say this, I think, to you with all humility, and I don't in, in, intend to, like, say, look, you know, this problem of evil thing, um, uh, didn't Alvin Plantinga bury that thing? Right? <laughs> Isn't the free will defense like the end all be all? Uh, all respect to, to Professor Plantinga um, because I think his logic is beautiful there. But there's, some, there's a remainder for us to wrestle with. And, and I, I think that the idea that a subsistence of immortality in human beings that becomes fixed, that they continue to hate God without God's restraint because they become truly what they are, um, makes more sense of what the scripture tells me than, uh, than the idea that... Um, something God loved enough to create it would then be destroyed, and that's a superior answer to mm. the continuance of their existence. Mm. And I, I don't know. This is, it's, this is difficult stuff. And, and, and hammering it out and having good vocabulary for it is extremely hard. So I, I appreciate the question, and I hope I didn't just, like, send you away with, you know... Mm -hmm. That's a cute question. <laughs> but but uh, I take it seriously, and it's super challenging, and maybe we should just do a conference on that. But. Very good. Two more quick questions before we'll dismiss for lunch. Thank you also for your talk. Um, I'm a traditionalist with you, so I feel the weight of that objection. I want to know if we could turn this around and say that they share in this. You mentioned that beauty, truth, and goodness are convertible, mm -hmm. right? Isn't a corollary of that that goodness and being are convertible? Uh, Do they not face the problem of the destruction of being as an eternal ugliness yeah, I mean, in creation? Uh, again, you know, this is, uh, this is classical theism, and Thomas Aquinas says exactly what you're saying. Um, goodness and beauty are convertible terms. Hmm. I think it's in the first chapter, for goodness sake, hmm. of the Summa Theological. Hmm. Um, so, so is, that, is that a reason they won't find your explanation as the traditional doctrine being beautiful convincing is they have to reject that goodness and beauty are convertible because they reject that goodness and being is convertible? Yeah, is, is the subsistence of immortality in the human soul... Um, 
in a sense, a continued donation from God himself. Hmm. And that's tricky theology. There's no doubt about it. Um, and this, I would have to say that if God already gave you the donation of subsistence, of immortality, that um, it would take a special act of revocation. Um, and I don't see that. Um, and I think, you know, I bet this afternoon that mm. Chris is going to try to make me see that. But, sorry, if I just, well, would you say that would be ugly? You know, going back to the beauty thing, if he did in fact do that. Uh, well, I would say the scripture tells us that a live dog is better than a dead lion. Mm -hmm. um, well, we've got to wrestle with what that means because it's a, you know, analogy too. Mm -hmm. um, that means that someone who exists in a mean state is still better than someone who doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, using death as an analogy, right? Excellent question, and before we take the last one, I'd like to comment on what you just said because I know you turned it. Um, I think you've put your finger on the issue. Uh, even though this has been called a rethinking hell conference, I think for the people, particularly from my church, the more central issue is rethinking immortality. That's the more central issue because everybody's rethinking hell from all positions. But the issue is, is an immortality inherent and a gift to every human being at conception? Or is immortality a gift and every human being from conception, including Adam and Eve, are naturally mortal? That's the issue, in my opinion. Yes, sir. Last question, and we'll go to, go to lunch. I appreciate you sharing with us. Thank you. But it seems like when you refer to Westminster Confession of Faith, you're being an illustration of the previous lecture it's telling us that tradition becomes equal to the authority of Scripture. In the first chapters of Genesis, who was the first one who told us we will never die? I'm sorry, please repeat the question. In the first chapters of Genesis, who was the first one who told us we will not certainly die? In the image of God made he them. And then uh, what did the devil say to Adam and Eve? when he tempted them. You shall not die. You shall not die. How are, you, uh, are, how are you saying they died on the day they ate of it? I am not, but I just wanna bring up the devil is the first one who said, you certainly will not die when you eat from the fruit of the knowledge of the good and evil. I think the devil lied and I think God was true. And, and, so, uh, and on the day they ate of it, they did die. And so Adam and Eve had the opportunity to eat from the tree of life, but God kept them from the tree of life, and so they could not live forever, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and so do we, because we cannot eat from the tree of life, do we still have immortal souls, even if we cannot leave, eat from the tree of life? Well, I think I brought the scripture that said that, that uh, putting, that God put in us, in our very hearts. Mm. So, again, I mean, I don't think you have to 100% agree with me, but I did want to say something about the Westminster Confession of Faith. You're saying that by me putting up the Westminster Confession that, that I'm elevating tradition above Scripture, but I don't think that I'm doing that. I think what I'm doing in putting the Westminster Confession up is... Uh, taking what I believe to be a true representation of Scripture in brief. 
mm. and presenting it to you. And which is why I pointed to the footnotes and you can right. certainly go online and look at, at those footnotes and you right. can either agree with the divines or not. I happen to agree with them. Right. Mm. 